to take a break from eschatology here and find out a few things because here's a man that was with Abraham, had all of their flocks out and everything, had, both of them had plenty of money, plenty of flocks, they were both wealthy. But then the herdsmen came in and said, hey, there's not enough grazing land out here for both of us. So Abraham walked by faith and he said, Lot, I want you to take your choice. Now, you, you have the first choice, where you want to go, what part you want to take. So he looks out there over all the plains and he sees all this beautiful land out there and grazing and everything else and looks towards Sodom. You know about Sodom and Gomorrah where all of the pedophiles, all of the homosexuals and so forth and the Sodomites are at. That's where Lot went. So we're going to dispense. You can look those things up and you can read about that but due to our time and so forth, I want to get to the gist of the situation and get some very practical lessons because if you make the wrong choices and go and just go by sight instead of asking the Lord, is this what you want me to do? Instead of doing it, and then ask the Lord to bless it when it wasn't His will to begin with. And sometimes people make that kind of a mistake, you see. So anyway, you can, don't turn there now, you can just uh, read this for yourself when you're at home or you have a little Bible study to the 13th chapter of Genesis. <coughs> there were five cities on the plains, and they were Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Seboyim, and another little town called Zoar. These five were filled with filth of the homosexuals. And they were perverted, but this whole area was so filled up with them that God said, I'm going down, and this is going to be the judgment on them. I'm going to wipe them all out. If you didn't know this, in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, concerning God says, if a man has a relationship with another man, they are both to be put to death. I didn't create Adam and Harry, I created Adam and Eve to repopulate this earth. Now, we're getting to a situation where the homosexuals are going to, uh, they're going to uh, not patronize this store because they don't agree with them and so forth and uh, one is Target and uh, maybe they're going to give in to it and so forth there and there's some other major stores that are going to give in and as far as supporting the homosexual and so forth we have uh, Gay Day and so forth and uh, our president wants to uh, uh, you know endorse that and so forth so America is just following the path of Sodom and Gomorrah, Zeboim, Adma and Zoar there now, to do that, here's what Lot did. He looked there and it looked wonderful. Nice cities there. This is where I want to go and take my family. So he did. He moved over there, and there's other things that uh, are involved that uh, the cities were attacked. They took Lot as far as prisoner. Abraham went after, rescued him, brought him back, and brought him back to Sodom. That's where he wanted to live and so forth like that. So, in Genesis chapter 15 to chapter 18, verse 15, it deals with Adam, or it deals with Abraham and Sarah, and then you pick it up in verse 16, and there's where we get it there, and go on over to chapter 19. So, let's go over here to chapter 19 of the book of Genesis, all right? And we're going to pick it up there. This is where it talks about and gives the details of this. Very interesting, because... When you get here, we're getting so much of this that all the gay rights and all that kind of stuff, and yet even preachers have come out with this, and it's unbelievable, your ELCA, your Evangelical Lutheran Churches of America, now with their hierarchy of idiots up there, which don't believe the Bible, said it's all right now, we can ordain homosexual preachers, and that's all right. We have two churches in town that do that. They're in that organization. Now... You have this coming all over America. You've got the gay rights that are going to uh, uh, not patronize this store because they don't believe and agree that it's all right to be gay and to be a homosexual and so forth. And you can see where this, even our president, is catering to them because he wants their votes. But when it comes to the Bible, we're seeing churches <coughs> and pastors that are just bowing down because they want a congregation. And the point is, 
they've had that. We knew a homosexual that, uh, or a gay man that was part of one of these churches here. He's since dead now, but, and so forth. But we come over here, and I'd like for you to go here. And anyway, God has sent two angels down and uh, there in order to visit Lot, and they were to view the whole area and so forth like that, and to tell Lot, hey, God's going to destroy this place. So as soon as he took them in, and he entertained them and so forth, now angels can appear in a human body as they did when the Lord Jesus was here. There was one, all angels are men. They were never created to reproduce. They're all men. There are no women angels except what we have on earth now. We know we tell our wives that they're angels and, and uh, if we don't we better, you know, if you want to stay married. And But no, we consider our wives as an angel. But literally the angels were all men. There were no women angels. They didn't have wings and they don't sing. Now that's contrary to what a lot of things that you see and you hear. Now we come over here to the 19th chapter here and we find out here uh, if we pick it up here in verse 1 Genesis chapter 19 here in verse 1 the two angels came down and anyway prior to that Abraham when God appeared to him and uh, he told Abraham, I'm going to send the angels, we're going to look this over here, but it looks like we're going to destroy these five cities. And Abraham said uh, to him, he said, now, are you going to do this? Or are you going to destroy these five cities here? If, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he said, uh, would you destroy it? If there's 50 righteous, would you not destroy it? The Lord said, all right, if I find 50 righteous, I won't destroy it. Well, he couldn't find 50, so... Anyway, Abraham said, how about 45? Couldn't find 45. Then he said, how about 40? How about 30? How about 20? If you find 10 righteous, will you spare it? He said, yeah, I'll spare the city. If we find 10 righteous, you couldn't find 10. There wasn't 10 out of these five cities that were righteous, that were not totally perverted. Boy, that's amazing, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? That's how filthy, when you talk about homosexuality, most people are being brainwashed in, this is just an alternative lifestyle, and we're going to prosecute you if you insult them in any way, because then you have a hate crime, and therefore uh, you can be prosecuted. I don't know why they don't prosecute the homosexuals that say, I'm not going to patronize your store because of their hate. I think that's pretty hateful, don't you? to try to get you and get back at you because you don't agree with us, we're not going to buy anything from your store and we're going to get every homosexual we can in the area not to buy anything from your stores. I think that's pretty hateful, don't you? In other words, we want our rights, but we're not going to give you your rights. No, don't tell me I hate a homosexual. I hate the homosexual's lifestyle, but I will witness to any homosexual. <coughs> But I also have a right, I'm not going to associate with them where people see me associating with them and think that I agree with their lifestyle by being a part of them and with them at a party or something else or this or that. No, count me out. I want you to know where I stand as a Christian. No, I'm not going to treat them anything but other words like I would anybody else. I'll speak to you on the street if I know you or there. I had, when I was on the police department, I had two lesbians that helped me out tremendously. They were lesbians. They were very nice and so forth. I witnessed to them. They were very nice to me. They were not going to change. But the fact is that I spoke to them, treated them like anybody else, but they knew I didn't approve of their lifestyle. I told them, God didn't approve of your lifestyle. Jesus Christ died for you, paid for your sins, they didn't want anything to do with it, but yet they were nice to me. I treated them like I would anybody else, but I'm not going to associate with them. In fact, I'll say this, they helped me uh, solve some uh, crimes in the city of Troy, Ohio. They surely did. So we had that kind of relationship, and I wouldn't associate with them at a, uh, at a social gathering or anything else, because I don't want a part of that. 
Do I hate them? No, I don't hate them. No, I hate their lifestyle. They're going to hell if they don't trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. But, no, the Lord sent the two angels down here, so as soon as they got down here, the first thing that happened with Sodom is to where Lot was at there, uh, is that here came the men of the city knocking on the door and about to break the door down and said, send these men out that we may know them. And the word know in the Hebrew means we want an intimate relationship. We want a sexual relationship with this fresh meat. That's what we want. Lot said, no, 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 no. So, to tell you when you're in the wrong place where you shouldn't be, you made the wrong choice, and you walk by sight and not by faith, then let's see in verse 11 what uh, uh, Lot did. This is unbelievable. Now, he had four daughters. Two of them were married, and two of them were still living at home. So, anyway, we'll pick it up in verse 10 of the 19th chapter here, if you will. And it says, But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them, that's the two angels that came down, and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. So this means they were young men, they were older men, small and great. Uh, they could have been leaders of the city and so forth, but it included all of them. So that they wearied themselves to find the door. So the two angels had the power to strike them blinded. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides your sons-in-law and sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-laws here, which married his daughters, and said unto them, Get you up, it's going to be destroyed, and so forth. Now, very interesting, also, in verse 8, notice what Lot did. Let's go back. And he said to these men, these homos, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known men. They were virgins. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do unto them as, as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. Well, they couldn't do anything under the two angels anyway, because they saw they were going to strike them blind. <clears throat> For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. In other words, take my two virgin daughters and give them to these homos. That's how low you can get when you walk by sight to something that looks good that you know you shouldn't partake of. Pretty soon you'll compromise here and you'll compromise that. It just uh, sort of blows my mind a little bit that a man would offer his two virgin daughters to this pack of wolves out there that are perverts just to get him off of his doorsteps and so forth like that. But what Lot didn't know, and we'd already read it, they just smote the men and made them blind and so forth. And then they told Lot, you better get your sons-in-laws and your two daughters, the two that are married, and tell them we're gonna, uh, God's going to destroy this place here. You see. Now, coming down here to verse 15, And when the morning arose, the angels hastened, Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and your two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of this city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of the two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth, and set him without the city. They took him out. Now, it seems here, if we go back to verse 14, that he tried to get his two daughters that were married and the two sons-in-laws, but they just laughed at him. So he didn't have much of a testimony to begin with, or they would have known that if he said this was of the Lord, uh, they would have listened. But look at verse 14, And Lot went out, and he spake unto his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But it's seen as one that mocked unto his sons-in-laws. So they just mocked at him, laughed at him. What are you talking about? It's almost like the flood when Noah preached there, you know, for 120 years. And they said it never rained on the earth before. You mean to tell us that this so, so God that you claim that created this earth and it was going to destroy it with a flood? It never had a drop of rain come from heaven. The earth was watered from the dew. It came up from the ground. 
And, uh, and they just laughed at him. And they were all destroyed. Even his two daughters that he bore and his wife would not listen. Neither would who they married, their two husbands, wouldn't listen either. And they were both destroyed. So even if he had won them, that would have been four, and the two daughters, five, six, and the wife and, and Lot would have been eight. You still couldn't get ten. And God said, I'll spare the city for ten. You couldn't find ten. In fact, Lot didn't even win his two daughters, his sons-in-laws, and his wife got destroyed and lost everything by moving to a city that he should never have moved to whatsoever. That would be like for you going to a nudist camp and pitching your tent. Well, you're going to get so misled that this is all right. Everybody's nude. You know, we don't think anything about it. I'm just using that as an illustration because they're all over the place too, if you didn't know it. Yeah. Well, yeah, America's saturated with them, if you know where to go. I don't know where to go, but I've read about it in the paper, and I've read other things and so forth. See, haven't seen it lately on television, but I know they're there. You see. Now, that's amazing because that's a total of eight. We're looking at verse 25 and 26. Let's go over here. We're just getting highlights now. In verse 24, the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plains and all the inhabitants of those cities and that which grew upon the ground. I mean, he desecrated everything. Even all of the vegetable uh, and the plant life and everything else, it was gone. There's nothing. Nothing there at all. And the Lord destroyed it. He said, as we've said in Leviticus, if a man lie with a man, both are to be put to death because I'm trying to breed a nation called the nation of Israel and I don't want it corrupted by these perverts and these misfits and their twisted minds thinking that having a sexual relationship of a man to another man is normal. It is abnormal. It is satanic from the word go and they are satanically influenced. They are doing what Satan loves to do to corrupt society and he'll use human beings to do it in any way that he possibly can, including in the sexual life. And he's pretty well accomplished it in America, truthfully. Because it's a hate crime if you say anything against a homosexual. You're attacking them. You're, uh, uh, you're, you, you don't understand they have a right. Only in you misfits' eyes that are our leaders of the country, but not in the eyes of God, which... Now you can begin to see why. Get God out of the schools. Get the Bible out of the schools. Don't teach our kids anything about that. Don't tell them, God, you're going to corrupt our society. We want a peaceful society based on do whatever you want to do and you'll be happy. And nobody's going to interfere with your lifestyle. And if they try to do it, we'll prosecute them because they don't have a right to insult you if you're a homosexual, you say. But the homosexual has all the rights in the world to attack little young children, bring them up, and now they can adopt children. Isn't that wonderful? Homosexuals can adopt children. And legally, in some states, they can do that. Where are the leaders at? We don't have them anymore, folks. Because the Bible is almost obsolete. Only as a front for a social club that they have misnamed as a church. That's what we're living in now. What is it a sign of? It's a sign of the last days. In fact, if you go to Luke chapter 17, you'll find out that God uses that as a sign of the times, as in the days of Lot's, as in the days of Noah. We're seeing it, and those are the signs for the tribulation. But we're seeing him at the end of the church age showing we are close to the rapture of the church to take place when... Every Christian disappears in a moment of twinkling of an eye. And other than that, Lot is hardly mentioned anymore at all. God just put down here what can happen when you walk by sight. It looks good, but it's not the will of God. So, let's go on down and find out what happens. In verse 30, And Lot went up out of Zoar, and he dwelt in the mountain. Now, Previous to that, I'll just give this. We don't have to read it. You can read it yourself when you go through it. 
Lot had petitioned God and said, don't destroy Zoar, I'll, I'll go flee to there. God said, all right, I won't do it. I won't destroy Zoar. You're going there. Well, he went there and then decided, I don't think this is such a good place after all. I'm better, I'm better off in the mountains. So he took off in the mountains. We come to that in verse 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar. He dwelt in the mountains and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Now we have three out of eight. Five were destroyed because you took them there, Lot, and you shouldn't have. She looked back became a pillar of salt. You mean a literal pillar of salt? Well, she wasn't in her body. He made salt. He can make a pillar out of it if he wants to. She's out of the body. Couldn't make any difference anyway. But the point is this. By a decision that Lot made, who was the head of the family, he lost five of his family. He lost his wife. He lost his two daughters. He lost his two son-in-laws. And he's left with only three left. His two daughters and himself. So, they go there, and then, <clears throat> we find out, they end up in a cave. Now, you've got to remember this when you look back, just briefly. You look back, and he started out, and he, he was loaded. I mean, he had everything. He had all of the cattle and all of the uh, flock of sheep and stuff like that. He had everything. In fact, he had so much, and Abraham had so much, that there wasn't enough grazing area and there in order to handle all the flocks that both of them had. And that's why Abraham said, okay, Lot, you take your choice. Pretty good decision, Abraham. You take your choice, Lot. So he got out and he had all of this. Now you got to remember when he went to Sodom, he had all of this wealth and everything, all of his flock and everything. But when he left Sodom, he had nothing. He ended up in a cave. He no doubt had a nice home in Sodom. He lived with them. He didn't witness to them or anything, or anything like that. He didn't even win his daughters. They didn't know they got destroyed. He ended up in a cave when he had all of this. Abraham had built an altar and kept on flourishing. Lot, we don't find an altar that he built. He walked by sight and not by faith. Abraham walked by faith and kept everything that God had blessed him with, temporarily. But Lot lost everything that he had, and he was a very rich man when he went to Sodom. He ended up in a cave with two daughters, lost his wife, lost his two other daughters, and lost his two sons-in-laws. All because he made a wrong decision. It looked so good to him. He should have asked the Lord, is this where you want me to go? But he didn't. He didn't build an altar. He didn't confine with the Lord, anything like that. Now. We find out also, if we go here to verse 37 and verse 38, when they're over there, the two daughters said, you know, we're not going to have any seat. Mom's gone and so forth. We're going to get our uh, dad drunk. We're going in and have a affair with him so that we can get pregnant and, and uh, keep the seat of our family going here. So in verse 37, it says, in the firstborn, in verse 36, and they were both, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. If you read prior to that, they went in separately. One night, one went in and got the, uh, or prior to that, and got their father drunk. And, uh, and then when he passed out, they lay with him. She had an affair with him. And they, in verse 37, the firstborn bear, that was the oldest one, and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. They became enemies of the Lord, and so forth. Although, out of being enemies of the Lord, very, very wicked. Also, we find in verse 38, the younger she also bare a son, called his name Ben Amni. And the same is the father of the children of uh, Ammon, or the Ammonites, unto this day and so forth. They also became a wicked nation, also. But out of that shows us one thing no matter how bad a family life you come out of, still God can use you. Years on down the road, Lot's lack of faith and direction reappeared in Ruth, the Moabite. Moabite. And through that, she was the great-grandmother of David. Therefore, 
a member of the Messianic line as recorded in Matthew chapter 1. So she turned out pretty good marrying Boaz, a Bethlehemite. So out of that line, which not many were because they were constantly a thorn in the side, all of this because one man who was a leader of the family walked by sight and not by faith. How important it is when you get married that you marry a man, first of all, that wants to serve the Lord, wants to be the leader spiritually in the family, and wants to guide you to do things the way the Lord wants it to do, and have a wife that has the same thing. That's why we never marry a lost person with a saved person, because you're going to have trouble with your father-in-law if she's not saved or he's not saved. You're going to have problems. So, we never marry anybody unless both of them are Christians so that you have the same outlook spiritually and you can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes a difference. So when you do that, this is pastor's responsibility on who they marry. And I remember a, fellow, a girl that came to me down in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And uh, she came and she said, uh, you know, I met this most wonderful man and uh, so forth, and he just treats me like I'm the queen of heaven. And uh, she said, we want to get married. He loves me and I love him. I said uh, uh, to her, I said, uh, is he? I've never met him. And I said, uh, is he saved? Well, I don't know about that. I said, well, why don't you bring him in? Because unless he trusts Jesus Christ as a savior, I'm not going to marry you because you are a Christian and you're headed for problems down the road after all the lovey-dovey gets over and raised to start Roman Catholic. We sit down and led him to the Lord just like that. Easiest thing in the world. And he trusted Jesus Christ. Savior said, I've never heard that before in my life. He said, you know, my whole family was Catholic. And he said, uh, that's all I know. I don't uh, believe, uh, uh, you know. I just, I, I, I went to church. I did what Mother wanted me to do. And I went there and so forth like that. And therefore, so I married him. Did great. Had a child. Part of our church. And did wonderful. The point is, I wouldn't marry them unless he trusted Jesus Christ because you're marrying a person that is going to run his life on the flesh and she wanted to run it by doing what God wanted her to do. So you have a division right now. Love blinded that problem that would exist six months to a year, year and a half, two years later. So he trusted Christ. They both had the same outlook spiritually. And the very first thing, I'll never forget, he called me and he said, Pastor, i got to talk to you. He said, the first thing, my mother, she is furious that I trusted Christ. I told her, Mom, you got to trust Christ to your Savior. You're not going to heaven. And this purgatory stuff is a bunch of crap. It doesn't exist. And he got to reading his Bible. This after a few months went by. And he said, no. And he said, Pastor, I want to tell you something. Every time I'm near my mother, all she wants to do is give me some liquor to drink. He said, I told her, Mom, I don't drink anymore. I don't want to, oh, what's the matter, are you too good? And had to go through all of that, and he said, you know, I'm getting to the point to where, I'll tell you what, I don't want to be around my mother. She's driving me away, she's driving me, she wants, she wants me to turn against God just because of her religion. You know, and do things that I know the Lord doesn't want me to do, and I don't want to do it anymore, I've drank enough. I don't, I don't want to drink that liquor stuff anymore. And if we're going to have children, I don't want to raise my children in a home where a drunken dad or we have a fifth sitting over here, we got Vakia or Seagram 7 or whatever we got here. We don't, we, don't, we don't want that in the house and so forth. But that's the difference there. Lot should have had some principles and sought the will of God before he took it upon himself just because it looked so good. He wanted to get the best. Abraham kept all of his wealth. Lot lost all of his and ended up from a nice home in a city that was filthy and ended up in a cave. And the city got completely destroyed along with the other four. Now, was Lot really saved? Go with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter. Will you please? In your Bibles to 2 Peter. Now, I want to ask you a question in church. And you, you tell me, from just what we've studied right here, would you think this was a saved man or a lost man? I mean, everything he did was contrary to the will of God. Now, if you didn't know anything about the Bible, 
Wouldn't you think he was lost? Let me ask you, wouldn't I would? How about you? Is there any indication that he was any way a Christian? Not really. He did about every stupid thing you could do. Lost his family and everything else. But let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, okay? Let's go over here. 2 Peter here in chapter 2. That's sort of interesting because we would have no idea whether Lot was saved or not if God didn't have Peter to write down about him and uh, tell us if he was or he wasn't, all right? 2 Peter, let's begin in verse 6, okay? It says here, And God turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that should after should live ungodly. Primarily, it's returning to homosexuals. They were stenching God's eyes, filthy, dirty, stenching God's eyes. <coughs> Excuse me. And he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Means they were a thorn in his side. But he didn't do anything about it. For that righteous man dwelling among them, that righteous man, man, I don't see anything righteous. There's not one thing written about Lot that's righteous. Other than the fact he got out when he found out he's going to get killed and die with the rest of those homos. But he left. That's the only righteous thing you do, and God had to send two angels down and let him know it's going to be destroyed, and you better get your 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 legs moving and get you get what's left out of there. He tried to take them all. His sons in laws wouldn't go, his two daughters that married them wouldn't go, and his wife turned around when God said, Don't look back, and she didn't go, she didn't escape. So out of eight, there was only three that made it, and that was two daughters that was with Lot, and the angel had to take them outside the city. I'd say. And you're telling me that righteous man dwelling among them? Righteous? Can't find one thing righteous about him that God put in the Bible. But he was a saved man. Right? <coughs> he believed God, that he was the God of creation, and that he was, if we'll put it in our time element here, yes, he was a Christian, but he was a carnal Christian, if we put it in our time element here. Dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. In other words, it was a thorn in his side. He knew better. That's why he got vexed with it, because his conscience couldn't take it, and so forth. Now, I want to bring out one more thing before we close this morning, because we're getting so brainwashed in the United States of America concerning these homos and pedophiles and so forth like that. I want to give you... And we're going to read it, so go with me in your Bible over here to the book of Romans. Will you do that in chapter 1? Let's go over here in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to begin here in verse 18. Now, since we're getting all this, oh, they're just good people, and they're nice people, and so forth like that, and there's no reason they can't adopt children, and, and you shouldn't uh, 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 treat them any other way, and you shouldn't speak out against them. This is just an alternative lifestyle. You've got to respect their lifestyle as anything else. So let's begin here in chapter 1 and uh, here at Romans in verse 18. And I'm going to read down to the end and then I'm going to close. So I want you to see what God thinks of these perverts that are perverted from righteousness, from the truth, and from God. I want you to see what it says. Let's begin in verse 18 here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, every filthy thing they do, they say it's all right and it's true. It's a, that's all right. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things to him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Then in verse 21, because that when they knew God, no atheist was ever born an atheist. That person, every individual, is born with a knowledge that God gave them that nobody, the invisible things that God made are clearly seen. You see the whole universe put together. So that you're without excuse. Somebody had to do it. There is a God. There is a power. 
Everything's held together by the power of his word in Ephesians 1, 3. So, or not Ephesians, but in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Because that when they knew God, see, they knew God. They knew there was a God. Every person born knows there is a God. Every atheist has to be taught to be an atheist by the wisdom of men, not the wisdom of God. In verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed or exchanged the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like them to the crop of the wind and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And he goes on down and gets specific. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them over, up or over, unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. You're born to know that you are a man. You're born to know that you are a woman. And you're not to wear women's clothes, men, and so forth, as we see so prevalent today. And it is out there sickening. But it's all right, according to some states. It's okay. You know, it's just their lifestyle. This one man up in Canada, I don't know if you watched the show or not, he was the head of the largest Air Force they have in Canada, and they finally caught him. They finally caught him. He would go in and break into homes when the people were not there and steal all the women's clothing, the lingerie, and so forth like that, and all their underwear. And he had a stack pile. He had it hid at his home. And then it got to the point he got caught and he murdered. It led to murder and so forth. And he took pictures of himself dressed up with a bra on and with the panties of women's and so forth like that. This is unbelievable. I couldn't believe what I was watching. They did a whole, they, they did a whole documentary on it. And this just happened about a week ago when I, when I seen it. I could not believe it. And neither could the police believe it. This is the guy that we respected. He, had, he was the top man over the largest air force in Canada and they finally caught him, and nobody could believe it. I mean, they were furious, and so forth. You have no idea who's doing what or what's doing who anymore in this world. We are so twisted in our thinking and our minds because our leadership. Now, that was an exceptional case because the leadership did not do that. But Canada is also in the same situation of don't, don't say anything against homosexuals. They're the same as America now. But this happened back, I think, two years ago or something like that. And notice what it says here. For this cause, in verse 26, God gave them up to vile affections for even the women who changed the natural use, that's how you were created, you're a woman, stick with it, unto that which is against nature. It's against nature for you to want to have an affair with another woman. I mean, that's not natural. That's unnatural. That's why God made men. And he says, likewise, also the men. You men are about as screwed up as they are. Leaving the natural use of the woman, that is to have a relationship for not only producing offspring, God made it enjoyable when you're married. There's nothing wrong with that. But now... We're having babies when you're not married, and then we're killing them. And the Supreme Court says, that's all right. Just kill it. Just abort it. Crush its head with those forceps that go in there. That's okay. Even Bill Clinton would not sign a late abortion. In other words, you can go right up almost to the time to give birth and kill the baby. Clinton had the opportunity to sign a bill that would prohibit that, and they refused to do it. That's Bill Clinton, our previous, one of our previous uh, presidents, of course. But likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one for another, men with men working that which is unseemingly. In other words, nobody can believe it that has a natural mind. If you have a normal mind, you, this is hard to believe, folks. And receive in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meant. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, well, I can understand that, because God says you're a liar. God says what you're doing is wrong. 
No wonder they don't want a Bible. No wonder you don't like to retain God in your knowledge because your conscience can't stand it. Get God out of here and let me do what I want to do to satisfy the lust of the flesh. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, I want to read verse 29 to 32 and we'll stop and tell you what God thinks about these homos so that you know. Instead of being brainwashed with, we need to accept this. No, you don't need to accept this. You shouldn't accept this. You should stand on what God says in the Bible because here's what God says about these perverts, all right? I mean, let's read it. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And is it amazing that for the first time in our nation we've ever known of a word called AIDS, AIDS. Now, how many hundreds and thousands of these pedophiles and homos and lesbians have died of AIDS? It's amazing, isn't it? It sure is. But what I'm saying is this. You need to know what God says about these perverts and these child molesters. And if you didn't know this, you need to know it. And if you want the documentation of it, I'll be glad to give it to you. It came out of the Star Review here about four years ago or so, or five. Forty-eight percent of the priests in the Roman Catholic organization are homos, and many are pedophiles. And you're just hearing in the last year, we had another that got convicted. I think he gets four to six years in prison and so forth. He covered up for it because we didn't want to hurt the organization. They are some of the worst I've ever seen and how anybody would ever, knowing of pedophiles, 48% of the priests are pedophiles and homos? In a Christian so-called organization that says we're the one world church of the world? Brother, you're about as perverted as anything I've ever seen, you see. In fact, I met the man and talked with him and ate supper with him and spent about two hours with him up outside of Cleveland, Ohio, at the great university up there where he is the psychiatrist of the pedophiles that are in the Roman Catholic and he wrote two books of which he was kind enough to give me for Tried to lead him to Christ and could not do it. He absolutely refused. So this is a good place to close. But what I wanted to do is bring this out here because there is consequences when you make decisions by the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and not after Christ. In Romans 6.16 it says this, Know you not that whosoever you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether it's sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Every Christian has an old nature, and you have the Holy Spirit is the new nature, and they're both trying to get you to listen to them. The old nature will try to get you to fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life which all are in a parish. The Holy Spirit says, I want you to follow me. I will give you and put into your mind the Word of God that will give you answers to make decisions that you need to make so God can bless you. And in this wicked world that we live in, I don't know about you, uh, I do enough things not to get the blessings of God. I want to do some things that do get the blessings of God. Amen. And, uh, but everybody has an old nature, and only when you meet Christ in the air will you have and put off this old nature, there will never be sin, sorrow, death again, because you won't have the old nature, and you will have the privilege to judge some of the most wicked angels that ever were on the face of the, of the earth. So, let's just stop and bow in a word of prayer, if you will, okay? If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, you can do it now with your head bowed, your eyes closed, and thank God that He put in here about what society is trying to corrupt your mind with to make you accept things that God says is some of the filth of the world. 
that are living this way, and that is some of the homosexuals. Of course, murderers are too, but I mean homosexuals and pedophiles trying to <laughs> uh, re rebel against stores because they won't accept them. Yeah, it's because just what he said you are. You're haters. You don't like to retain God in your knowledge because it convicts you so bad you can't live with it, so get God out of there and let me do what I want to do, and your end is destruction, sir and ma'am, if you want to follow that. Lot had everything and lost everything. Let's pray. Father, we're just... Thank you so much for putting some of these things in the Bible that can just sort of get our mind on the right track and understand how you describe these pedophiles, these homos, and you destroyed whole cities. I mean, that was everybody. There, there was only three people that came out of Sodom. Only three. You destroyed five cities, saturated, completely taken over with homosexuals. I thank you, dear Lord, that you put it in the Bible so we can see the severity of what you think. I thank you for putting it into Romans, how the man leaves the natural use of the woman, burned in his lust one toward another, and how that you, there's nothing you can do with them. Once they're that perverted, very rarely can you do anything with a man that is that sold out to Satan. We just ask your blessings on the service today, dear Father, and just give us a good day today, and we're not going to let the world turn against you by accepting what you condemn. Thank you for the Bible. Give us a good day and a good week. In Jesus